Not only does the psalmist here, David, tell him his soul to bless the Lord, but he commands everything inside of himself to bless the Lord. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. I love Psalm 66, 1 and 2. I don't have a slide, but it says, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give him glorious praise. The psalmist in Psalm 66 and the psalmist here is not content to give the Lord perfunctory praise. And what is perfunctory praise? I'm sorry, I love to use big words sometimes. It just feels good. It's the nerd in me. (laughs) Perfunctory, let me find my definition here. It's something is done without interest, without enthusiasm, without care simply because it is expected or it's a habit. It's characterized by routine or superficiality. So perfunctory is just ho-hum. Well, you know, I'm supposed to do this anyway, so I'm going to do this. Okay. Hallelujah, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Okay, good. Is it over yet? Okay, good. And, And the psalmist is not content to give that. And if we're all honest, we've all given the Lord perfunctory, ho-hum, uninterested, unenthusiastic praise. Amen. We've all done it, but it's okay to tell ourselves, "Uh uh-uh, nope, not today. Not today. So we're going to get enthusiastic about the Lord. Okay. And it's not fake to do it. Sometimes people get all upset looking around at other people getting excited for the Lord. It happens. We can be real, right? Sometimes we look at what are they all excited about? That's just fake to me. No, it's not fake. The same way it's not fake when you go to a sporting event, and everybody's getting themselves all riled up. Oh, we gonna win today. Any New York Knicks fans out here? Oh, very few. A couple. We got the, the, the diehard ones. We've been encouraging ourselves in our fandom for, for decades, right? And it's the same thing. That's why they have pep rallies. That's why in the locker room, they're like, well, we gonna win today, y'all. We're gonna win today. Because we are the redeemed of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah, we're going to bless the Lord today. Why? Because he saved my soul. Amen? He redeemed my soul from the pit. He's provided for all my needs. Oh, we're going to bless the Lord today. Amen? Amen. Yes. Yes. And it is okay to exclaim, and even if you have to work it up in your soul, it's not fake. It's giving the Lord the glory and the praise that's due his name. It is, it is what is, the, it's the right thing to do. Yes. It's just like if, if somebody gave you a million dollars and you were just like, okay, thanks. <laughs> hey, that, they don't make no sense. That would not make no, no one here would do that, okay? You would just be jumping out of your seat. And see, the thing is, God tells us here to not forget all his benefits. And this is what helps us to give the Lord glorious praise because we so easily forget. And we need to remind ourselves and remind our souls of all his many benefits, which we will go through now. We have many benefits from the Lord that includes him forgiving us all our iniquity. He heals all our diseases. He redeems our life from the pit. He crowns us with steadfast love and mercy. He satisfies us with good so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. We'll talk more about the forgiveness of all our iniquity in a little bit. And here we also see that the Lord heals all our diseases. Our God is a healer. And the healer is in the room, y'all. The healer is here. You see, We, we pray sometimes that this would be a thin place, right? That's the phrasing Pastor Mike uses. That this would be a place where the presence of the Lord would be tangible. It would be felt that we would know that God is here. He's promised us he's here. Where two or more are gathered in the name of the Lord, there is Jesus in the midst. Amen? Amen. He said he will never leave us or forsake us. He's given us his Holy Spirit. That is the promise, the guarantee that we are not alone in this life. Amen? 
that he walks with us and we would desire to feel him, to know him, to experience him. And in one of the ways that we experience him, he is the healer. Amen? Yes. He, he will heal our physical bodies. Now listen. He tells us to come to him in James chapter 5. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. I don't want to be a man of little faith, but I have to be honest. He may not heal every single time we ask him. But he will heal all of us when he takes us home to be with him forever. Amen? Amen. That is the ultimate healing, and it will happen for those of us who are in Christ. But here he tells us that he wants to, he's willing, and he is able to do something miraculous, and that is to heal us. And James tells us that sometimes we don't have because we simply don't ask. And James is saying, listen, if you're sick, if you need healing, go to the elders of the church and ask to be prayed for. Get anointed with oil, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And furthermore, if such a one has committed sins, will be forgiven. Amen? You can come and say, hey, I, I've sinned. You don't even need to be specific. And just say, and we'll lead you through a prayer and confess before God so that you can be forgiven. Amen? And we don't have to walk around with the burden of our sin weighing down on our shoulders. And if you don't know who the elders are here, Pastor Mike and I will gladly tell you who they are. Just come and ask. Amen? And sometimes the healing won't come right away. But this is why he tells us in Matthew that if you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open. You'll ask and you'll receive. And those of us who've heard enough preaching, we know that that language is saying, keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. And there's nothing wrong with continually bringing our requests to the Lord. Amen? So look, come to the elders for prayer. And literally, if we could bring up that slide of the benefits again, it says that he redeems our soul, our life from the pit. Literally, God has saved our souls from hell, which is what that's talking about. Hell is a real place. Heaven is too. And the destination of those who have trusted in Christ, those of us who've received him, is heaven. And those of us who reject him, so hell is a place that was never created for human beings. The Bible tells us it was created for the devil and the angels that rejected him. But hell is the only place where God is not ruling and reigning. Well, where God's presence is not enjoyed. And so those of us who reject the enjoyment of his presence for eternity and never come to repentance, that is the unpardonable sin. Anything else can be forgiven. But if we reject Jesus forever and eternally and never come to him, our destination is the pit and it is not a fun place. I grew up listening to rap songs and spouting nonsense about how I wanted to go to that place because that's where the fun was. That's where the party was. There's no party in the pit. There is none. But God has done everything so that we never have to go there. I say that you have to crawl, you have to crawl over the dead body of Jesus, kicking and screaming as everyone pulls you back towards heaven in order to get there. Jesus, we know he's not dead. And so he's done everything he can so that no one has to go there. But it is a very real place, and we can rejoice in the fact that he has redeemed our life from the pit. Amen? Amen. And he crowns us with loving kindness, and he satisfies us with good so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Life in Christ provides peace and rest. 
Jesus says, all you who labor and are heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. If we are laboring and we are heavy laden and we feel burdened, we can go to Christ. And he promises us rest. And he tells us to take upon ourselves his yoke. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I can, I can tell you that there is a work and a labor that though it's hard, when it is the yoke of Christ, there is rest there. I think Pastor Mike can testify of it too. I mean, preparing a sermon week in and week out, there's labor in that. But in that labor, because Pastor Mike is called to it, I know that there's rest there. There's joy there. And that's what Jesus means when he says take his yoke upon him. It's not that we don't work hard. But because God has called us to that place, because we're there with him in our labor, there's still rest. Amen? Amen. And if, you find, if we find ourselves burdened and heavy laden and we find no rest, let us take that as our signal to go to Jesus and say, Lord, please let me take your yoke upon me and not my own. Amen? It comes life in Christ with assurance that he will provide for our needs. And then looking further on in verses 8 through 14, we read this. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the character of God. Merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We often associate in our culture God with wrath, anger, and judgment. And listen, God is not to be toyed with. The rap song said, I ain't no joke. Well, he ain't no joke. This is true, but God's character is multifaceted, and this is an important aspect of God's character, and it's so important we read the word so that we know the fullness of God's character. There is, uh, you know, Pastor Mike once talked about that the scripture, it's, it's, it's good for our mental health. Being, abiding in Christ, abiding in the word, reading the word, it's, it's healing for our minds and our souls. And knowing this about God will provide healing and rest and comfort, and it will help with anxiety. Because so many of us have this anxiety that God's standing there like this. Uh-huh, go ahead, I got, I got you. Go ahead, mess up. Mess up one more time and see what happened. And that is not the character of God. He's not harboring down on us, looking for any excuse to snuff us out, amen? He's looking to be merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Merciful means to be compassionate. It means to have a sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. God sympathizes with our weaknesses he knows our distress and his desire is to alleviate it not to make it worse God's desire is not to make our stresses worse amen and it's good to know that about God so many times we don't come to him we're stressed out because we have a wrong idea about him or we have half an idea about him and we don't have a full idea about him. He's also gracious, which means to be marked by kindness and courtesy. God's character is marked by kindness and courtesy. I mean, is it me or we don't often associate these characteristics with God? Am I the only one? Oh, I got one witness. I'm glad. I'm glad. And we can also... You know, not that we need to argue with people, but even when we hear people attribute bad, false ideas to God's character, knowing this can give us rest for our souls. We don't need to argue with everybody, but it's important to know God's character. And he's also slow to anger, which is self-explanatory. It takes a lot to get God angry. We all know people that when you hear, oh, so-and-so is mad at you, you're like, well, what did you do? 
Because we know it takes a lot to get that person angry. Do, do any of you know someone, it takes a lot to get them angry? Okay. Yeah. Huh? John Macapote. Uh, you know what? I can testify. Listen, I don't, I've never seen the man upset. A couple times. Uh, semi. But even then, it's like... And you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. <laughs> like, I have never seen the wrath of John on display. Let me tell you, if somebody said John is upset, the first question to me is, for me is going to be like, well, who did it? Who did what? <laughs> somebody did something. And this is the same about God. If he's angry and he's letting his anger be known, you know it took a lot to get him there. I, I didn't um, do my research in, uh, in between services. God was speaking either to um, Abraham or Moses, I don't quite remember, and he was like, you know, you'll be in Egypt, your people be in Egypt for 400 years, um, and then you'll inherit the land because, you know, my judgment on the Amorites is not yet full. The Amorites and the Canaanite, God was looking at them like, you know, y'all are really messing up. Y'all are really, y'all are bad. Y'all are awful. And he gave them 400 years, y'all. Could you imagine? Somebody's upsetting you, is wronging you, they're stealing your money, they're mistreating your family, they're slandering your name, and you give them 400 years to get it together? I mean, we not, none of us going to live 400 years. Not, not this time. But it takes a lot to get him there, y'all. He's slow to anger. So the next time you're feeling like, oh, God, angry with me, you can tell your soul, soul, you don't know what you're talking about. Because God, my God is slow to anger. Okay? And when your friend tells you, I know God is angry with me, you can tell him, hey, you know what? Let's, let's sit down and look at Psalm 103. Because God is slow to anger. And what you're experiencing is not the anger of God. So let's talk about it. Let's, let's see what we can come to a conclusion about. And his abounding in steadfast love. And this steadfast love is the word chesed, which Pastor Mike has taught on many times. And this is kind of like a summary definition based on the research I got. So if you want my source for this, you can come see me afterwards and you can get all the details. But chesed, it is a love that goes out of its way to provide love, covenant faithfulness, mercy, grace, kindness, and loyalty through acts of devotion and loving kindness that go beyond the requirements of duty. I mean, just meditate on that. This is what God is constantly doing for us. He's constantly going out of his way to demonstrate acts of devotion and loving kindness and, and loyalty and mercy and grace to us. Amen? Amen? And it is abounding. He goes on to say in verses 9 and 10, he will not always chide, which means to give a voice of disapproval, nor will he keep his anger forever. God is not constantly getting on our case. You know how sometimes parents, some of you parents might know this, or some of you children who had parents who was constantly getting on your case, or you had teachers who were constantly getting on your case, or bosses who were constantly getting on your case. This is not God. God is not constantly getting on our case. He will not always express a voice of disapproval, nor will he keep anger forever. Verse 10, he does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. This goes back to the mercy of God, which we were talking about before. There are times when we think, oh man, God's punishing me for my sins. And this again is why it's so important to read the word and hide it in our heart. Often we feel hopeless and overwhelmed and condemned and ready to give up. And what will help us, what will change our perspective, comes from knowing the scripture, which will lead us to knowing and understanding God ourselves and understanding our circumstances better. The things that we experience in this life are never punishment for sin. The punishment of sin is death. 
eternal death, which we read in Romans 6.23. And he punished Jesus on the cross for our sins. And God is not into double punishment. He's already punished Jesus. What we may experience are consequences, results, ramifications, if you will. Another big word. It just means consequences. If you don't pay your rent, eventually you're going to be taken to court by the landlord. If you keep not paying your rent, eventually you're going to be out of that apartment, right? That is not punishment for sin. That is the consequence of not paying the rent. Amen? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I could say a whole bunch of other things, but I won't. <laughs> You, um, you can use your judgment. You go to work, and you're constantly on your phone, and you don't do your work, and you get fired. It's not because the bosses don't like you. It's because you didn't do your job. <laughs> That's it. God does not punishment, punish us for our sins. He doesn't deal with us according to our sins, as he says there. For as the heavens, verse 11, are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. We cannot measure the loving kindness, the steadfast love, the chesed that the Lord shows towards us. As the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards us toward those of us who fear him. And it's important that we remember that. Th this here, it's telling us that his compassion is great towards those of us who fear him. And what is it to fear God? Yes, we should be afraid of God. It is appropriate to fear God. As Jesus would tell us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, don't fear man who can only kill your body. But do fear the one who is able to destroy both your soul and your body in hell. It is appropriate to be afraid of God, but there's more. There is awe. What is awe? It is an emotion that is variously combined with dread, veneration, and wonder that is inspired by authority or by the sacred or sublime. Awe includes dread and wonder. The same kind of dread and wonder that we would all feel if we were to get into a boxing ring with Mike Tyson during his prime. There would be both dread, oh, M goodness. And there would be wonder. I can't believe I'm standing in the ring with Mike Tyson. <laughs> like, that would be an amazing thing. There would be wonder there, and we'd be right to wonder. It'd be the same kind of dread or wonder if we were in an MMA ring with Royce Gracie during his prime, the Brazilian jiu-jitsu master. It'd be the same kind of wonder if we were in, on the basketball court standing in front of either Kobe or LeBron or, or Jordan in their prime. Choose your greatest of all. We won't debate it here today. <laughs> there is a level of respect that we have when we stand in front of such greats. And that level of respect is commensurate with who we're standing in front of. And for me, respect has been one of the most helpful definitions for me when it comes to the fear of the Lord. There, I love the Bible app. You got all kinds of versions, including the easy to read version. And we're going to look at the easy to read version of Psalm 34, verse 9. The Lord's holy people, say it with me, should fear and respect him. Don't say this part. Those who respect him will always have what they need. My mama used to say, I'm not one of your friends from the street. <laughs> she would say, I'm not one of your little friends from off the street. 
And, and, and you already know what that means, right? She didn't have to say it. She said, you going to respect me because I'm not one of your little friends. And it would do us well to keep that in mind when it comes to God. God is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. No one's ever loved us. No one's ever been more gentle, more welcoming, more tolerant. He puts up with a lot from us. But he's not one of our little friends from off the street. If we, if God was, if we could see God standing before him, when you read in the scripture, those who came into the presence of the Lord, they fell to their knees and their faces were hit the ground and they became prostrate. And that is the appropriate response to being in the presence of the Lord. And, and we, listen, God is so great, but we can all confess we've all been disrespectful of the Lord at one time or another. I, had a, I run a senior center, and I would have um, people, back in the day they had this thing called welfare to work. If you were receiving a public assistance check, they sent you to a job. I had a lot of interns who were from this program, and a lot of them were young and beautiful women, and I had this one senior, he would always try to flirt with them. <laughs> Listen, you know, people don't change, y'all. Apart from divine intervention, apart from divine intervention, people don't change. We only become more of what we actually are. That's it. And if you were a young wannabe papi chulo, you're going to be an old wannabe papi chulo unless God changes you. And this guy was an old... Want to be Papi Chulo. <laughs> and he, got, and listen, these were some tough young women. They, like, this was the Bronx. This is the Bronx. They, they was tough, okay? And they, they were Puerto Rican and Dominican. And I don't mean to be stereotypical, but some Puerto Rican and Dominican women in the Bronx or from the Bronx ain't no joke and not to be played with, okay? <laughs> and they came to me and they were like, this man is getting out of hand. And so I had to confront him. And I was like, all right, this is happening. And you need to stop or you can't come here. And he started trying to smooth things over with me. And he wanted to shake my hand. And I told him, I will not shake your hand until you tell me that you understand what I said and you're going to stop doing what you did. And in that moment, he was being disrespectful. And it was my responsibility as the director to say, you're not going to come up in this house and be disrespectful. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah. Yeah, so. You would never let someone come up into your house and disrespect you. And you shouldn't. And don't ever feel afraid to exercise the authority in the place where God has placed you. Yeah. God has placed Pastor Mike here as an authority and I respect him. And we respect him. God has given authority to Julie in the back as a head of Sunday school at Kids Church, and we respect her. And we come into the house of God, we respect God. God deserves our respect, and when we're disrespectful and things, we face consequences of our disrespect, we can't get all out of hand and some, you see, God has provided us, I'm running out of time, he's provided us the forgiveness of sins. As far as the east is from the west, he separated our sins from us, says Psalm 103. And the great picture of it is this. If you're walking east on the earth and you keep walking east, let's say you had a land bridge to take you all around the earth and you kept walking east, when would you be walking west? Never. Never. You will always be walking east if you keep going east. If you start walking west and you have that land bridge that takes you across the entire earth and you keep walking west, when will you be walking east? Never. And this is what God is saying. When we've surrendered our lives to him, when we've confessed our sins and we've received his forgiveness, we will never come back into contact with that sin again. Amen? Never. We will never come back into contact with the condemnation associated with that sin. 
we will never come into contact with judgment over our sin. Ever. But there's a condition. 1 John 1 9 says, if we would confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Proverbs 28 13, he says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Some of us want the mercy of God without confession. It's not possible. That's an impossibility. Some of us want all the blessings from God, but we want to be disrespectful to him. And it would do us well to remember he's not one of our little friends from off the street. And he deserves our respect. Amen? Amen. But he's still a father who shows compassion to his children. And he shows it to those who fear him, says verse 13. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. God knows how fragile we are. He knows that even in our pride and our unwillingness to repent. He knows that even in our frustration where we say, God, I'm so mad at you. He knows in our unwillingness to surrender, no, God, I'm not giving this up. All of that is simply weakness on our part. It's frailty. And he remembers that all we are is dust. And this is why he will not always contend with us. Because it's his goodness that brings us to repentance. And he knows that if he would contend with us forever, we would not be able to stand before him. He knows. He knows you and I, and he still holds his arms open. He says, come, come to me. What what can we apply here? We should bless the Lord. These are our application points. And sometimes we need to command our soul to do so. We should remember and constantly remind ourselves of the Lord's character, merciful and gracious, loving, kind. And, And Jeremiah says, the one who boasts, Let him boast of this, that he knows me, the Lord, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness and righteousness in all the earth. I think that is so amazing that that would be our boast. Lord, I know you. You are the Lord and you exercise loving kindness and righteousness in all the earth. That is my boast, Lord. And we should fear and respect the Lord. And we should also quickly Run to the Lord, confessing everything and expecting mercy and grace from him. And we should remember that the Lord knows us. And I just want to close with a verse in Hebrews. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He sympathizes. But one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord, here we are. We stand before you. We come before you. Why don't we all stand? Lord, we honor you. You are the Lord God Almighty, and you've done such wonderful things. You've healed us. You want to continue to heal us. You've forgiven us. You've separated our sins from us. And Lord, we are so thankful to you, God. We honor you, and we give you glorious praise for all of who you are. And Lord, we come to your throne of mercy and grace now, and we need your mercy and your grace now. And Lord, we know we will find it because you have promised it. Lord, we thank you. We commit ourselves and this service to you in the name of your son, Jesus. And we say together, amen, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together for Pastor Solo. What is such a great word? We're going to close the two last worship songs. And what I want us to do during the first song is I want us all to come to the altar this morning and to take communion. And as we take communion, you can get on your knees on the rug if you want, but let us come forward. Let's confess our sins today. And let's receive that forgiveness and that cleansing that is available through the blood of Jesus. Let's not hide our sin.
must not have secret sin because of solo red. He who covers the sin will not prosper. Let's come to the Lord today. Let's get right into the Lord. Let's come to the altar. Isaiah 53, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. We love you, Jesus. We come to you this morning. Help us walk in the light as you are in the light. Help us be open and honest. And none of us is perfect, Lord. That's the whole point. We're not perfect. But we can come to the perfect one. We can be honest and confess and receive forgiveness. We worship you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Two last songs. I want everybody to come forward and take communion. Let's come to the altar. Come on, let's get right with God today. Let's repent. Let's confess our sins. And let's, let's receive that cleansing that's available through the blood of Jesus' name.